Let's have our panelists please come to the podium or come to your chairs. Uh, we have Lawrence Massell, president of the Civic Federation, uh, a man who is uh, known for his uh, exciting <laughs> topics, good natured jokes, and positive news. How about a big hand for Lawrence Massal? <laughs> Next to him, we have Kathy Rigg, president of Voices of Illinois Children, and as it so happens to be a graduate of Roosevelt University. Oh, wow. Kathy's also a former state rep. <laughs> and Next to Kathy is Robin Staines, who is the executive director of Advance Illinois Education Group. And uh, how about a round of applause for Robin? <laughs> now that we've got that out of the way, if you don't like what they say, you don't have to applaud from now on. This is just a, <laughs> the, the, the gentleness of the city club. Each will speak from approximately five to seven minutes on the topic uh, dealing with the state. And all, that for, and all that goes with it. And I know yesterday there was some concern when I said up for this meeting that on the way out, if you're really upset, everyone who asks can get a vial of hemlock. I was only <laughs> joking. Maybe, maybe not. Okay, Lawrence, you're up first. Civic Federation, Lawrence Massal. Thank you, Paul. Thank you, Jay Doherty. Thanks to all of you at the City Club for having us here today. You know, when I was talking to uh, my chairman, Tom Livingston, that I'd been invited to speak to the City Club of the regarding the state's financial situation, we both kind of scratched our head and said, who would want to come to an event like that? <laughs> Who'd want to hear about the unappetizing situation in Illinois? And then Tom pointed out, you know, when the Titanic hit the iceberg, they were still requiring reservations in the dining room. So I want to really seriously thank all the Civic Federation board members who are here today and all of our other friends that are with us today. Gr great um, opportunity to be with two really uh, of the leaders in uh, policy in Kathy Rigg from Voices for Illinois Children and Robin Staines. So that Titanic metaphor is something that keeps coming back to us to those who look at the state's financial situation. If you think back about how confident people were that something was unsinkable, that there were a lot of warning signs, icebergs that were known to be in the area that were ignored and we kept steaming ahead. The state's financial situation is a mess. Even after raising the income tax last year from three to 5% for individuals, and from 4.8 to 7%, and when you include the personal property replacement tax at 2.5%, we have an effective corporate income tax rate of 9.5%. Even after that action, the state is still not able to pay its bills. By the end of this year, which is fiscal year 2012 for the state of Illinois, we expect that the state's gonna have over $9.2 billion in unpaid bills obligations of the state, vendors who have delivered service, some of the most critical services the state provides to the developmentally disabled, to the elderly, all are being stretched to the limit. A recent report by the Civic Federation projected that if things stay the same and the state continues on the path it is right now in terms of Medicaid and the pension program, the unpaid bills for the state of Illinois will rise to over $34 billion in the next five years. It's not a cheery thing. It's not something that the Civic Federation is happy to be talking about, but it is the fiscal reality. Moody's Investment Investor Services, one of the major bond house credit rating agencies, recently looked at the backlog of unpaid bills for the state of Illinois the inaction by the General Assembly and the governor toward meaningful pension reform to bring down the over $85 billion in unfunded liabilities. They looked at all of that and proceeded to downgrade the state's credit. Those of us in Illinois sometimes lose perspective, but it's important for everyone to understand that when Illinois has the worst rated credit of all the states, according to Moody's, it's also important to know how far away we are from the other states. There are currently 13 states in the United States that have a AAA rating. All of the rest have a AA rating, except California 
and Illinois, and Illinois has now passed California. That has enormous implications for our cost of government, for our local governments. Anybody who does business with the state of Illinois is being impacted by that. What the bond houses, credit agencies, and everyone who looks at the state's fiscal situation objectively knows is we have some very unsustainable trends. The rising cost of the state's Medicaid program and pension system are consuming our state budget and are going to force continued cuts and reductions in other programs. The Medicaid program, which many of you are aware, is a joint federal and state program that provides health care services or health insurance for our neediest population, as well as long-term care for our developmentally disabled, as well as our elderly population who does not have significant assets. In the next five years, the cost of the state's Medicaid program is projected to grow by more than 40% to $12 billion by fiscal year 2017. According to the governor's Department of Health and Family Services, even if Medicaid appropriations are allowed to grow at 2% a year, which would be far in excess of the other projections for, spent, for appropriations increase, even if we let the Medicaid program appropriations grow by 2%, the unpaid bills for the state's Medicaid program are going to rise to over $21 billion. That means $21 billion in a backlog of bills owed to doctors, hospitals, and pharmacists, and other health care providers. The state's pension system is currently taking about 17% of all of the general fund revenue for the state of Illinois. Part of that is because of the, unf the growth in the unfunded liability, the pension holidays and the partial pension holidays and the underfunding that we have done for many years. But another cost contributor is the borrowing that the state of Illinois has done. Rather than pay for the pension contribution out of existing operating revenues, we've had a few years where we actually issued bonds and borrowed money to contribute to the pensions. Now as a result, we're paying over a billion dollars in debt service costs for a pension contribution that we made years earlier or we were responsible for. It's projected for these pension funds, which are now 43% funded for the state of Illinois, and to put that in perspective, that means we only have 43% of the assets needed to pay for the existing promises and obligations that are now known for the state employees and retirees. In the next five years, that is expected because of the 50-year funding ramp or plan that we are on to grow to over 21% of the state's operating budget. So one in every $5 of all state revenue will be going to fund the pension um, program for the state of Illinois. The state doesn't have that money. The state has to bring down the cost of its pension program. It is terribly unfortunate that we find ourselves in a place in Illinois with not being able to fulfill the promises that the previous general assemblies and administrations have made but there is no realistic means to find $85 billion to pay down that unfunded liability. We're going to have to take a two-pronged approach. Some of you are familiar, and we have some friends here from the Civic Committee of the Commercial Club, which has been doing an outstanding job of helping to raise the concerns and draw attention to the pension system. We are going to have to change the benefits for existing employees going forward. The governor last week, for those of you who missed it, called the General Assembly into session and asked them to rendezvous with reality. He said the state's fiscal crisis is one that can no longer be ignored. We were very pleased that the governor understood the seriousness of which the state finds itself. The Civic Federation's recent analysis of, the Civic Federation, I should say, has not completed our analysis of the governor's 34 billion dollar spending plan. But we do recommend it as nonfiction reading for those of you who have trouble sleeping at night. There are some very good things and, and unfortunately some very harsh realities in the governor's budget. The governor called on the General Assembly 
to make major pension reforms. Now, he did not include any specificity as to what those reforms would be, but we are encouraged that he is a team led by his um, assistant, Jerry Sturmer, that is set to um, come out with a plan, according to the governor, by April 17th to stabilize the pension system. The governor's budget also called for very significant cuts through almost all agencies of state government. He identified over three dozen state facilities that will need to be closed. This is going to be enormously difficult for the General Assembly and the governor to achieve. The governor charged the General Assembly with reducing the Medicaid spending by $2.7 billion. That is the amount of which his proposed budget for fiscal year 2013 underfunds that program. The governor has threatened the General Assembly that if they don't deliver the $2.7 billion in reductions in the Medicaid program, then he will keep them into overtime session. Julie Hamos, the governor's director of health care and family services, has identified just how difficult this cut is going to be. It represents almost a fourth of the Medicaid program for fiscal year 2013, and it is, according to Director Hamos, going to require significant reductions in the reimbursement rates that the state provides. Civic Federation is encouraged that the governor and the General Assembly are recognizing the magnitude of the problem, the pension reform efforts, the facilities closure, and the Medicaid cuts are all part of a long overdue but necessary and painful process to dig the state out of its fiscal hole. It's true the state did not get into this mess overnight, but we must stop digging. We cannot afford to continue to borrow for our operating budget or to spend more than, we, than the state takes in. So we believe that it is a positive that the governor has identified the icebergs, even if he has not quite identified to the General Assembly how they can avoid hitting them or getting off of them. And to talk more about our crews, I'm gonna turn it over to Kathy Rick. Thank you. Thank you, and Lawrence, I wanna especially thank you and the City Club for the invitation to be with you today. Um, we often get a chance to present the material that our organizations are known for. We seldom get the opportunity to be at the same table at the same time. And so I think this leads to a very productive conversation and hopefully informative for all of you. So I very much appreciate again the opportunity to be here. And for those of you who are not familiar with Voices for Illinois Children, we are a statewide policy and advocacy organization that works across all issue areas that affect children, families, and communities. We are a nonpartisan organization, and we have a component of our work that is called the State Fiscal Policy Center as part of Voices for Illinois Children, and that work focuses on the analysis of budget decisions that, again, affect children, families, and communities. So it's really important to have you as an audience today to understand that the state's return to fiscal stability and economic prosperity really depends on a deeper understanding of what kinds of strategic spending provide maximum return on investment. And this is the other side of the coin as we talk about the reforms needed to invest scarce taxpayer dollars into services that, again, really have a return on investment. So in considering how the fiscal crisis affects early childhood, it's important for you, again, to understand why early childhood investments, or more importantly, the lack of those investments, affects you as business people and all of us as taxpayers in Illinois. So today I'd like to provide you a roadmap, <clears throat> excuse me, a roadmap to that understanding. First of all, I want to provide some of the data that describes the state of the state for kids. And then I'd like you to understand some of the research that points us to what we should be doing to support children's success. 
And then thirdly, I'd like to explain what is happening to those effective programs given the state's fiscal crisis. So number one, the data. Our data comes from an initiative called the Kids Count Data Book. We are supported by the Annie E. Casey Foundation to produce an annual book that is a state of the state snapshot of indicators that demonstrate how children are faring. That work analyzes the best available data to measure the educational, the social emotional, the cognitive, the economic and physical well-being of Illinois kids. So the data from our 2012 report, which was released last month and will be the subject of a symposium that we're hosting this Friday, tells us there are three million children in Illinois, 620,000 in Chicago. About 20% of Illinois children and 32% of Chicago children live in poverty. It's important to understand how poverty is defined. The poverty level that this data reflects is an annual income of under $23,000 a year for a family of four. We know that these figures reflect the impact of the Great Recession, but we also know through Brookings Institution research that children's poverty rates continue to climb even after the economy begins to recover. One in four Illinois children lives in a single parent household. 38% of single mother households live in poverty. That's an annual income of less than $19,000 for that family of three. In the 2009-2010 school year, more than 33,000 homeless students were enrolled in Illinois public schools. And in Chicago public schools, more than 85% of students come from low-income households. Wide disparities among racial, ethnic, and income groups are evident in the indicators of academic achievement. And these figures are compelling because we know these children are at risk. The research tells us the long-term effects of poverty, which include chronic health problems, exposure to trauma and stress. And we know exposure to trauma and stress affects healthy brain development. Poverty also creates lower levels of educational attainment and diminished employment prospects. So the second part of... Whoever has that phone, can you turn it off? Sorry, go ahead. Okay. Thank you for watching out for me, Professor. <laughs> the second part of what I want to convey with you today is what we know from research. So Professor James Heckman is a Nobel laureate economist from the University of Chicago. He began his studies in developing workforce development theories and he landed on an understanding and research that demonstrates that it's early childhood investments that drive success in school and later in life. Birth to age five is a critical time in brain development, yet this age group has the highest level of poverty among children. According to Professor Heckman, quality early childhood education fosters cognitive skills along with attentiveness, motivation, self-control, and sociability, character skills that turn knowledge into know-how and people into productive citizens. So the good news in these discussions, and I want you to remember there is good news in these discussions, is that we do know what to do. We know what works. And when we talk about Illinois' response to this data and research, there's more good news. The Wilder Report was commissioned by Voices for Illinois Children, the Ounce of Prevention Fund, and Action for Illinois Children. The estimates from that Wilder report prove that the state's two decades of investments in school readiness generated 350 to 500 million dollars in annual cost savings in the K-12 system and other state-supported services. This is important to note 
As recently as 2008, Illinois was a national leader in early childhood education, in social and emotional learning, and in healthcare coverage for children, a national leader as recently as 2008. The bad news is that the budget crisis is putting these proven programs at great risk. For example, the Illinois Child Care Assistance Program enables low-income working parents to keep their jobs and it offers developmental opportunities for their children. This, is key, this program was a key to the success of Welfare to Work. And last year, the income eligibility limit for child care assistance was lowered, meaning fewer families were eligible and the proposed 2013 budget would further restrict eligibility. So the Fiscal Policy Center at Voices for Illinois Children estimates the cumulative effect of these reductions will be the loss of services for more than 25,000 children. In the Early Childhood Block Grant Program, again, a leader in the nation, um, I often get the opportunity to present in other states, and sometimes you have to leave Illinois to feel good about Illinois. But we were the envy of other states, given the investments that were made through the Early Childhood Block Grant. This program funds preschool programs operated by local school districts and qualified community agencies. And it offers the developmental services needed for infants and toddlers. The governor's proposed budget actually increased funding by $20 million. But this would still be $34 million below the fiscal year 2009 level. And due to budget cuts and delayed payments, participation in state-funded preschool programs has dropped by an estimated 18,000 children. Other programs that are important to the well-being of kids and families in, I have been cut as well, and more were announced in the governor's proposed budget. Prenatal case management programs were cut 17%. This is significant because these programs are very effective in preventing premature births. And premature births, as you can imagine, are very costly, especially, especially contributing to the cost of the Medicaid system. Home visiting programs support vulnerable families and teen parents. Funding has been cut 20%. These programs are effective in reducing referrals to the Department of Children and Family Services. They have a direct connection to reducing the need for investments in the child welfare system. School and community-based mental health services also cut 20%, after school programs cut 64%, and delinquency prevention programs cut 39%. <clears throat> So we have a call to action to you as our partners in the business community. And I had the opportunity to have um, this information published in Crane Chicago Business in response to the article that demonstrated that Illinois is competitive and attractive to the business community. We felt compelled to raise the alarm that that may be, but is that sustainable? We need business leaders to be part of the solution by becoming a voice for investing in kids and engaging with policymakers. We need to understand how important it is to invest in our children in programs that we know work to build a competitive workforce. Given the budget shortfalls, naturally the question arises, how do we pay for these programs? We recognize there are appropriate reforms that must be implemented to address the fiscal crisis. But the real answer is we cannot afford not to invest in these critical programs. We have to invest in the opportunities for children now, and we have to get them out of the budget crossfire. Thank you. Good afternoon. I'm delighted you guys haven't all fled the room yet. 
Um, I had the same reaction Lawrence did. I couldn't imagine anybody was going to show up for this lunch. You read about it in the papers, you're hearing about it on the news, uh, you know, enough's enough. And the only thing I was looking forward to was the first time I was going to follow a speaker, I thought it was right after Lawrence, that I actually felt good about following the speaker because I could only be more uplifting uh, than Lawrence's bad news was going to be. And I will say, if you listen closely, there is some good news in my remarks. So enjoy your dessert because there's a little bit of good news coming. Um, but I'm going to start with the more somber news. Uh, and then, unfortunately, I'm going to close with some bad news. The more somber news, because again, what, what, what Lawrence wanted to do was, was set the table and say, look, we're not getting our house in order. If we don't get our house in order, we're not going to be able to take care of the things, the investments, the fundamental investments we all know we need to do. And so instead of having those as two separate conversations, they need to be in the same time, the same place, and in our brains at the same time, which sometimes is complicated, particularly for legislators who have a lot going on. We have, see how nicely I was about that? We have, my sister's an elected official, so I've, I've gotten good about that. Um, we have a lot of educational catching up to do here in Illinois. Advance Illinois, we're an educational policy organization. My founding co-chairs were bipartisan. We're Bill Daly and Jim Edgar. You don't get more bipartisan than that. Because the truth is we all have a common interest in making sure that the fifth largest economy in the country, which is what Illinois is, stops being a laggard state. Right now we're behind in terms of virtually any measure you want to look at and how well our kids are mastering math, science, et cetera. The only bright light, we're a little bit ahead of this curve in how many kids were graduating, but the fact is they're not graduating college ready or career ready. In fact, of kids who start high school today, only one in four is going to graduate at all and graduate college ready at the same time. One in four. So, in a time where the United States itself is dropping against its trading partners, um, we're now 14th in terms of overall education levels of our citizenry. We used to be the number one, undisputed for decades. Every year, more countries are passing us by. We're in the bottom half, even of a country that is not holding its own. So we've got some significant work to do. Now, here's the good news. For the first time, we actually have a plan as a state to do just that. And we, the plan is so good that all the sort of people who watch these kinds of policy changes and early indications keep bumping us up on their list of states to watch who are doing, who are doing better and better work. We have agreed as a state for the first time, and I have to give credit to the Illinois State Board of Education. State Superintendent Chris Cook, not a guy whose name you hear a lot, has been really doing yeoman's service. Jesse Ruiz is the board chair and Gary Chico uh, since him, really holding the line. We've adopted a new set of academic standards. They're more rigorous. They're the, they're the kind that really will indicate whether kids are ready for whatever they want to do when they finish high school and actually do chart us against what our international competitors are doing. We've adopted those, but it's going to take real ongoing effort for those to get implemented effectively in the field. More on that in a moment. We have at the same time, we're raising expectations for kids appropriately and necessarily. We're doing the same for teachers and principals. They've got a harder uh, job to do. Let's make sure they're getting the preparation that they really need, the field experiences that they need, um, and then the honest feedback about their work, because this isn't a job. I'm a former classroom teacher in a Chicago public high school. This is not the kind of job you come into knowing what to do the minute you start. Get them the feedback and the development and the support that they need to do that. We have also taken for the first time some of the hardest work on, this is getting a lot of attention here in Chicago, it's actually work that's also going on at the, uh, the state level. We've got schools that have been in crisis for a long time and what do you do? And there are good ways and bad ways and Lord knows there's some interesting conversations about that, but it's not a problem we can afford to just continue to ignore. So we've got platted strategies in place, we've managed to leverage a lot of federal dollars, but to leverage those effectively, there are local resources and capacities we're gonna have to build. Um, we're getting much better information, both in the hands of policymakers and educators, but also in the hands of families. We're building a new longitudinal data system for the first time. It's going to allow us to follow kids from birth all the way through higher education out into the workforce. For the first time, I'm a former high school teacher. You'll know as a high school how many kids and families of high schools, how many kids are going on from your, your kid's high school into college or some post-secondary, and how do they do when they get there? How many need remediation? What sort of remediation? you can begin to make much smarter decisions as a family, as a principal, as a teacher, et cetera. So that is a huge ongoing project that's going to require us to stay the course. It also allows us to put together whole new report cards to get that information out to families. For the first time, we're going to be taking a developmentally appropriate look at how ready kids are when they start kindergarten. Not waiting until third grade for our first snapshot when we all know it's too late to start doing some of the interventions we need, but as kids are starting the K-12 system. But for those things to continue, we're going to need ongoing investments. And so the good news is we've got a plan. And the good news is other people are taking notice and actually giving us some applause. We almost never get applause for this here in Illinois. Sometimes you leave, you feel better. Here's the bad news. As the state increasingly uh, deals with all of these horrible issues that uh, Lawrence and the, uh, lays out in painful, painful, painful detail, and that we're all reading about, a couple of things are happening on the state level and the local level. First of all, 
the state is looking to shed costs out to the districts. This pe these pension issues you're talking about, I think most of you know that every one of those dollars from, from um, tax increases are going to pay for things that if we don't get right on them, we can't take those dollars and put them into these very sensible reforms and get them out into districts. They have to go to pay for additional pension Medicaid, et cetera. Um, so what the state's looking to do is how do we, it's trying to push costs out. So it's done a number of things. One. Chicago is unusual for those who really follow Chicago. The pension pickup payments that employers make are made by the local Chicago Public Schools District. That's not true around the rest of the state. Instead, the state pays that pickup portion. That's an $800 million line item on the state budget, which they'd really rather not have. So they're trying to push that out. There is, there is legislation being discussed that would take those $800 million in costs and put them out into local districts. Now, that may or may not be a good policy move, by the way, but that's an $800 million. The, money's, the, the cost isn't going away. You're going to shift that out to the local districts and more on the impact that's going to have in just a moment. Um, you know, two, there, we have 870 districts in the state, which is a very, very challenging amount of districts, puts us only third in the country for numbers of districts. So we need to have a regional system that interfaces between the central office out to districts. That costs money. The state's also trying to push that out to the, uh, to the regional and local level. Um, we're also doing another really interesting thing. We, nobody wants to cut general state aid, and I will, the governor, to his credit, sort of carved out education said this is the most pivotal investment that we make and I would argue it absolutely is of course everybody else has got investments is arguing the same but I think there's um, you know unbelievable and undeniable um, uh, basis for that and so he's trying very hard to hold it steady and so in this budget and in last year's budget nobody the house senate governor wanted to have to cut the general state aid we give to students so they didn't on paper. What they did was they didn't allocate 100% of the dollars. So when people say that they're holding general state aid flat at $6,119, that's true on paper. But if you look, you should start asking questions. How much have they actually allocated? And then the governor's proposed budget, it's 92%. So the districts out there are saying, well, that's lovely on paper, but we're going to have to plan for an 8% cut. Transportation costs, same things. We've been routinely cutting transportation costs because who cares about buses except that the truth is those costs in, in the main don't go away, though they are driving some interesting decisions about collapsing bus routes and a number of legislators from rural areas who have proposed legislation wanting to get permission to go to a four-day school week. So at the same time, Chicago is fighting to say, look, don't we need more time with these, you know, more meaningful academic standards? Don't we need some more time? You've got other places in the state saying, we can't afford to stay open that fifth day and give us permission to, sh to shrink our week. Um, so you've got the relationship between the state and the local, which you want to be a very good partnership, because we're all in this together, right? If we don't educate our kids well today, starting at birth and on up, we're all in trouble. As a citizenry and as an economy, that's framed because you've now you've got them pitting against each other. We can't afford what we've got, and so now we're fighting about who's going to pay for it instead of how do we really solve this problem so we can get back to investing. How is this going to play out out in the field? Kathy told you about early childhood, so I won't go other than to acknowledge that it, we are losing kids. We've been a leader. It's one of the, been the bright spots. It's To me, it's always the, we, we, we focused for 20 years on early childhood. We made huge gains. Now we need to do the same elsewhere, and we are starting to backtrack. And the K-12 system, not only are the reforms I described and others that I didn't bother you with, um, but are still wonderful, at, in jeopardy, but you're seeing an increase in class size. Um, and that's hard because we don't catch, capture the number. We will in this longitudinal data system if we don't undermine it. Uh, we'll be able to tell us this. But in a district like Elgin, it's the second largest district, um, five years ago, uh, I think it was 3% of students were in classes over the size of 30. Today, it's 20%. So in a very short time span, you're seeing that. The same thing's happening in districts around the um, district around the street. You've also got um, huge numbers of personnel cuts and teacher cuts. So last year, I think there were 2,500, roughly 2,500 teachers cut, and that followed the year before where 1,400 were. Now, I'm not here to argue that some of those may not have been necessary, and there's something about lean times that forces us to sometimes make hard decisions that need to be made. So there is some... There is the chance that the pressure that's being brought to bear is going to lead to some good policy outcomes. Unfortunately, there's also a number of things being considered which are bad policy outcomes, which are coming from that same pressure. And so the, the, with the conversations, I would echo Kathy that we all need to be taking this seriously, but I would argue we need to be taking it seriously and we need to identify where the pressure can be channeled into healthy policy changes that we're long overdue to make where we need to avoid doing things that are in the short term gratifying, but in the long term harmful to our kids, 
and we're also going to need to prioritize. Across the board cuts may not be the right way. I'm, you know, obviously um, uh, organizationally, personally, and as the parent of three public school students here in Chicago, delighted that the governor recognizes that we need to try to protect education if we can. But I'm also not foolish enough to think that if we don't get straight on the kinds of issues that Lawrence has rightly and repeatedly raised, that we're going to be able to protect it. Um, we're all going to go down. So um, we can do more in the Q&A, but sorry to close on a bad note and ask a question that gives us a chance to give you some more good news. Thanks. Uh, uh, Jenny will be. Uh, remember, brevity is not a vice. Uh, Tolstoyan questions we have. Uh, <laughs> That's a, that's a writer, McCormick. All right. Uh, <laughs> by the way, total agreement, don't they? Just presenting the problem, then the solutions. Now you know why there's not a single legislator here. Okay. Uh, <laughs> this is from Ruth. Ruth, where are you? How do you pronounce that last name? One more time. Correct. <laughs> Neighborhood Capital Institute. To Mr. Massal, you can answer right from your seat, Mark. Does your organization make any recommendations on the revenue side of the state budget? Uh, well, there's a, we'll start with that small question. <laughs> Thank you. Yes, the report that we released just a couple of weeks ago that talked about the growth of the unpaid bills if nothing more is done. The Civic Federation has tried to be consistent and looking at both sides of the ledger. The problem when you start to talk about additional revenue is that people jump to the revenue and don't talk about the structural problem. So we could, you know, theoretically talk about all sorts of new revenue sources for the state of Illinois, and people would think that it's gonna go to education or to early childhood or to other important priorities, but it's gonna go to the pension system unless we structurally reform it. It's gonna go to the Medicaid program um, unless we bring down that growth rate. But as an example, the Civic Federation has pointed out the inconsistency in the state of Illinois that we don't tax retirement income. The federal government does tax retirement income, the state does not. The Civic Federation's members, many of which are here, have said we're will we, we initially, before the governor signed the, the income tax increase, before the General Assembly took it up, the Civic Federation supported additional revenue if it was tied to the structural changes that need to take place. At that time, going back about two and a half years, three years ago, we needed to cut about $2 billion out of the operating budget. But we have supported additional revenue. We continue to recognize that even with the pension reforms um, that have been proposed, and really the only bill that is in a bill form is Senate Bill 512, which the Civic Committee of the Commercial Club has been pushing with the minority leader, um, in Springfield and that the speaker has co-sponsored, even with that, you're gonna need, with those reforms that go to a, a, a new tier system, um, you're gonna need additional revenue for that. So yes, we do support both, but we're not willing to, the, and the public is not willing to give the state of Illinois more revenue in the form of a tax increase unless they get some confidence that the money's gonna be spent differently. Any other? Go ahead, Ms. Ms. Um, in terms of the revenue discussion, too, the fact of the income tax increase that is often not clear is that but for the tax increase, the level of unpaid bills would be $15 billion. And it's still a staggering number at nine, but the income tax revenue did help pay some of the backlog of bills. Now, that's not a sustainable solution by any means, but it did help those providers, and that needs to become, continue to stay a priority because the backlog of unpaid bills is meaning programs that are working in communities are closing their doors. Children and students and youth are going unserved, and jobs are being lost. And those are jobs that are not able to be outsourced, and those are jobs that the income from those jobs gets reinvested directly in the community. So it is important that the balanced approach of considering um, the revenue and what needs to happen, given that the income tax increase is not permanent, 
offset by these reforms because, again, the figures show that it's unsustainable to continue a pension system and a Medicaid system that are unable to um, fulfill their obligations and need to have a serious consideration again. So the balanced approach of revenue and spending constraints are important to keep in a balanced way. Ms. Staines, you want to comment or you could pass? There's no requirement. I'll, I'll you have pass to pass on this one. Okay, good. <laughs> because now comes, now comes the, uh, the hits. Cowards die many times before their death. Valiant taste death but once. People leaving you. <laughs> well, what a surprise. We have a pension question. We got two pension questions. We got three pension questions. And we got four pension questions. And I'm sure if there were more of you here, there'd be five, six, or seven, or eight pension questions. But since I taught at UIC, I will read the one from Richard Johnson. Richard, where are you? Raise your hand. With all your colleagues back there, you, you band of marauders. Okay, here we go. Surprising is for Mr. Massal. I know, Lawrence, you're shocked by this, but move on. <laughs> Illinois has a gigantic revenue problem. The Civic Federation, etc., continues its attack on public pensions, which will provide little or no revenue relief, especially in the short run. Why doesn't the Civic Federation get behind something that would change the unfair regressive flat income tax with a progressive system that would help address the long-term uh, uh, crisis. We have one from Tom Gold from UIC, pretty much the same, and of course, Merrill Gassman from the from State University of New Winston, uh, et cetera. But you got the gist of it. Why are you picking on those pensioners, Mr. Masal? <laughs> if only my mom was here to see how I'm taking away her pension. Um, the Civic Federation, attention to the pension situation is based on the fiscal reality that we have an $85 billion unfunded bill that we don't have the money to pay for. The attempt to bring down the benefits for existing employees going forward is based in the reality that we've already changed the benefits for, um, em for future employees hired after last January, and there is no effective means to bring that down except to reduce that liability. The income tax increase, as was pointed out, is all going into the pension system, but it's not, we're not gaining ground. The unfunded liability is continuing to rise, so that's why we're going after the, um, the need to reduce the funding. When a f one out of every five dollars in the state's general funds are going to the pensions, it's not sustainable. It means there's going to be no funding for anything else. So, In terms of the graduated income tax increase, or the proposal to go for a graduated income tax. One, as, they may, as many may know, that requires a constitutional amendment. To pass a constitutional amendment, you have to get three-fifths of the members of the Illinois General Assembly to vote to put that on the ballot. Then you have to convince the public to give the General Assembly the power to establish a graduated income tax. And the advocates for a graduated income tax need to be straightforward and say, what's the new rate going to be? Not the identification of what the 1% population is going to be. So the Civic Federation is not opposed to a graduated income tax. We just see it as a very long-term, difficult thing to get passed. In the meantime, the state's finances are crumbling, and we may not be around, and the social service network might not be around by the time that gets on the ballot and passed into law. Good question, good answer. Mm. Any comments? Come on, Heather, you've been, you've been you know, I, playing. I, I, I'm, not gonna, I'm not gonna add to that particular. I just wanna set, again, one more piece of context. Um, right now, in terms of some of the unfunded bills, which are also part of the problem that we don't have enough, uh, the combination of structural needed reforms and, lack, and revenue, $800 million are owed um, schools right now. That's uh, between $350 and $420 a kid that schools are not getting, that they're having to bankroll. So, I mean, it's, it's and the same thing is true of universities. Um, you saw that the governor was talking about trying to increase MAP grants. We've become one of the least affordable states in the country in terms of post-secondary access. We used to be one of the most affordable, and that has dropped in the last 10, 15 years. Um, again, hundreds of millions of dollars owed to our state universities. If we don't figure out how we're going to make those payments, we are going to see, um, I mean, it, it just, it's just not sustainable. 
Okay, uh, this is a quick question. Uh, Lawrence, you are obviously the uh, man of the hour. Well, and you're certainly the man of the three, I'll tell you that. Uh, no argument on that one. We're not going to touch that one. Miss <laughs> <laughs> Wolf, the old Paul Green would have, you know, I know, yes. but we don't go there. This is from Sandy Blau. Sandy, where are you? Did you? Oh, I thought maybe you left, and I, of course I do this. Very quick question. Why aren't all state employees covered by Social Security? It's a great question, by the way. It is. Most state employees, what we traditionally view as the, the people who work in the Thompson Building or in the Stratton Building in Springfield, are covered by Social Security. Teachers are not, and university employees are not covered by Social Security. There's a small population of the existing state employees that, that they might still be working, but most of them would be retired that opted not to join Social Security. The justification, and there's been opposition by different um, teachers' interest groups in the past to joining Social Security, is the cost associated with it. It's, it's an additional, would be an additional cost. Certainly, some of the discussion about pension reform, in particular how it affects teachers, would be um, easier to, um, um, fashion a resolution to if they were covered by teachers. But at the end of the day, it's really a financial consideration how much it would cost for those school districts. Now, interestingly, Speaker Madigan, President Cullerton, and um, Governor Quinn have raised the idea of, and I think Robin mentioned that, of pushing the pensions for the, what they call the non-state employees, the suburban and downstate teachers, and the state university um, employees back onto those governments and out of the state of Illinois. Potentially, if anybody wrote down their ideas and put it in writing, you could evaluate that in the context of how they would pay for them and whether we'd be giving the school districts and the universities the authority to change the type of benefits, including whether they offer Social Security or not. Well, I certainly advocate that, just especially starting off with Macon County. Uh, those two guys from Decatur who want to secede, Start there. Let them start paying their own re pension requirements. That'll... Last question from Peter Benzinger. And Peter, you always are a reformer, no matter what they said about your run for office. <laughs> the budget process reflects a dysfunctional policy process. Okay. Driven by a dysfunctional electoral process. Can better campaign finance laws and redistricting process, not by those dreaded legislators, help solve these problems. Oh, since. That's almost as gloomy as, as Lawrence's general talking points. The moderator uncharacteristically will give the first answer, no. Now, go ahead. No, I, I, I'm going to disagree. In our work, we often engage in community dialogues, and we put the same information in front of the general public and our advocacy partners that I provided to you about the need to understand the data, the research, and investing in good outcomes. As good as that information in, is, and as much as people want to respond and find solutions, their cynicism keeps them from believing that anything will change until the political structure and the role of the leaders changes in Springfield. And that is driven by the control that the leaders have in campaign finance. And so the general public is so distrustful of the process, they would like to see that change. Is the feedback we get when we're talking about our priorities for children and families and communities. So I do believe that building public support will drive the political will and that it's very difficult, there's no question, in the state of Illinois, but that it is key to bringing people to the table in a way that they're more interested in good policy decisions than political expediency. Heather, you wish to touch that one? Very good speech. <laughs> Robin, That's I call okay. you Heather. <laughs> well, if you were Heather, you wouldn't be here because you'd be afraid. Go, go ahead, Robin, go ahead. Finance I said before, being mistaken for Heather is actually a bump up for me, so that's okay. Um, I would only add that I think that the situation that the state has got, if we're ever going to consider those things, which are unbelievably difficult to do for reasons everybody in the room knows, we're getting close to that point only because of we're, those, the, the chickens are coming home to roost from some of those dysfunctional policies. I think everybody knows that we've got serious investments that we need to make and continue. And I think everybody knows that those are at serious 
um, risk, and every year you think, gosh, it's gotten so bad, we're, we're really gonna have to come to grips, and then we don't, or at least not enough. And so if we're going to, we've gotten ourselves into a deep enough hole that you begin to talk about things that you wouldn't have talked about when the hole was a whole lot shallower. So um, I, I, I've never had a crystal ball when it comes to anything in Springfield, but um, it will be for very bad reasons, unfortunately, I think, if we do. Uh, you, you, you'll pass on this, uh, Lawrence, right now. I, would, I, I can't resist just saying that, yes, redistricting, yes, campaign finance reform would have a significant impact in how legislators approach their jobs and how decisions are made. But generally, you know, in, I, I, what I find frustrating is the conclusion that it's all up to one member of the General Assembly or two members of the General Assembly to decide what we do as a state. And that takes an awful lot of people off the hook. All 177 members of the General Assembly are up for election or retention or re-election, re however you want to look at it. They pass on the rules that set up a system that keeps them from having to make tough decisions. So if the public wants to hold the General Assembly accountable and push forward, and all of us um, have the opportunity to contact our legislators I can just, I can't resist saying it's an avalanche of mail for an individual member of the General Assembly to get 10 phone calls or 10 letters or 10 emails that are from real constituents as opposed to interest groups. So I remain hopeful that one, the financial problems are not going away and the pushing down, which is really what Robin and um, talked about at the local government level and that, and Kathy talked about, is going to impact people a lot more directly. It's affecting the city, it's affecting their school districts, it's affecting every unit of local government. And so the public is more aware than they were in the past. Well, I know for a fact that a better BAP and better campaign finance laws would certainly loosen the purse strings of all the taxpayers. They would just jump at the fact that the, I'll pay more taxes because we have a better map and a better process. Uh, that's okay. That's called a Stephen Foster answer. Beautiful dreamer. Moving on to the last question. The second cynical? Last question. Too cynical still? Too cynical? Yeah, thank you. Yeah. What is, this is from the uh, famous Mr. Mazur. No, no, Chris Long. From Chris Long. It's almost as famous. What is the response? You know who's sitting here? All right, get ready. Here we go. What is the responsibility of the media to inform the public in regards to these issues of campaign fundraising and of redistricting and of the budget crisis. And anything else you can think of that I'll repeat. Uh, they, they're not part of the media. They need those guys sitting out there. Look at McCormick shaking his hand right now, getting ready. Uh, obviously, the media has had a, good, a, a major effect in going after some of these people uh, with tremendous results. Haven't changed a bit, huh? Yeah. All right. Well, certainly the media, as, as the watchdog, is important, right? We all would agree with that. And I personally think they're doing a tremendous job. Did you hear that, Mr. Kern? Good. Okay. How about a big round of applause for our people?